Hey everyone, and welcome back to Miss Azrael's Gaming. So we're going to hop back into Terror Fest because we've got the new chapter today. Although you're going to be seeing this on Saturday because um, Argus did come out with their third episode. So if you've been watching my Argus videos, um, I'm going to be focusing on that as much as I possibly can. But I thought I would go ahead and jump back into Terror Fest as well, just to kind of put a little variety um, without having Argus every single day like I normally do. So we are hopping into Chapter 7, A Brush with Death. It says, on your quest to find the killer, you're forced to look at your inner circle. Now, if I remember the last time we were playing, although I did have sick brain at the time, so hopefully I can remember, um, I do know that Lucky and Zare, uh, they both left unexpectedly. And I believe we were attacked again by the Stabby Joe uh, murderer. Um, but we did move Coda out of the list of suspects. Um, everybody else kind of just left. I mean, we might not get attacked. I can't remember. Um, but I do know that Coda moved from the list of suspects because we kind of spent more time with Coda and learned out um, why he... Uh, was interested in Stabby Joe and all that stuff and had a shrine to Stabby Joe. And we did end up losing our kind of informant, uh, the journalist. Uh, we received her nose at the end of it. Stabby Joe sent it to us while we were at the library, still researching. So let's go ahead and jump back in. Chapter 7, A Brush With Death. As you stare down at the severed nose and blood-soaked carpet screaming fills your ears. Ah! But it's only when a hand clamps down in your mouth that you realize the screams are yours. You flail wildly and a familiar voice calls out. Easy, easy, it's me. You turn to find Coda staring at you wide-eyed. What happened? It's Bex. Who? The woman I was talking to at the hospital. She's a reporter. She's the one who sent me the pictures, and the killer just sent me her... You point to where the woman's nose is staining carpet, and Coda's jaw drops. Oh my god. Here, don't look. Without a second thought, Coda takes you in his arms, one, head, one hand cradling the back of your neck as you bury your face in his shoulders. The other rubbing calming circles on your back as you cling to him, and he gently shushes you. Just breathe, Azrael. It's okay. But it's not okay. Things haven't been okay from the moment you step foot back on the island. You try desperately to cling to reality, but you can't get the accumulating atrocities out of your mind. Ugh. <laughs> the glint of the knife slashing across Alan's throat. The lifeless gloss to your sister's eyes as she starts to go cold. Oh my god. We're all going to die, aren't we? The killer's going to get us all. None of us stand a chance. You can practically feel the killer's warnings weighing on you, and Coda jostles you hard. Azrael, hey, snap out of it. His voice is muffled and far away, but you latch onto the desperation in his tone and let it draw you back in. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You repeat Coda's words to yourself, letting the chant soothe away the heart-stopping dread until... Azrael? Coda's voice comes through loud and clear, and you heave a steady sigh. Fortitude. Your high fortitude allowed you to calm down. I'm okay now. It's just a lot. I mean, it is a lot if you think about it. Like, they have been through a lot. Like, two murders. Now she's got a body part thrown at her. Like, a normal person... I mean, you just couldn't... You couldn't take that. You couldn't handle that. That would just be too much for really any person. Believe me, I get it. What we're dealing with here, there's no script for this kind of thing. But you're handling it like a champ. I know you're right, I just can't let the killer win or do this without you. I mean, of course we're going to flirt with Coda. I can't do this without you. You take his hand, the warmth of his touch rooting you to the earth, when just a moment before you thought you might drift away. Seriously, Coda, I mean it. I've always been pretty independent, but dealing with all this makes me realize it's really nice having someone in my corner, especially when that someone is you. He lifts your hand, kissing the back of your knuckles with a small playing on his lips, with a smile playing on his lips. Trust me, Azrael, I have no doubt you would get through with or without me, but considering the alternative, with is preferable. 
Ugh. Reality starts to sink in as the librarian begins to come stirring from her place on the floor. You grab Coda's arm and pull him away. As soon as she wakes up and sees this, she's going to call Detective Porter, and we're going to be stuck here answering questions for the rest of the day. We can't exactly leave Azrael. It's a crime scene. Bex thought someone was targeting us. If she was right, the others are out there with no clue what could be heading their way. Coda shoots a look over your shoulder and, and shudders. You go. I'll stay here and deal with this. You can't bring yourself to look at the discarded nose. Instead, you nod and pull your phone out of your pocket. Shouldn't take too long. They should all be right. But as you open your My Friend Finder app, you can't help but trail off. Locate your friends. What the? Okay, well, there's Lucky. There's Zare. There's Coda. And there's Tyler. What? What's wrong? Shoot, my stream got froze there, so you guys didn't see, but it was a picture of my phone and it had a listing of our, all of our friends, so none of them are where they're supposed to be. He comes around to look over your shoulder, frowning at the little desperate bubbles representing your friends. That could mean anything. Maybe Bex wasn't the killer's first stop. Maybe the killer got to them. Or maybe Bex was right to be investigating our group, and one of them is the killer. The words tend to shiver down your spine, but you accept them, stealing yourself for any possibility. Either way, I have to find what's going on. Text me when the cops are gone. You turn to leave, but Coda catches your arm. Ezra, wait. You don't even know what you're rushing into. And I can't wait around trying to figure it out. Someone else could die, Coda. Hell, someone else might already be dead. Fine. But you've got a lot of ground to cover to get to them, so the order you choose is important is the order you choose is going to be really important. Whoever you go to last, make sure it's someone you really trust. Otherwise you could be giving the killer plenty of time to attack again. Okay, but what if the person I trust most is you? You know you're not off my list yet. How do I know I'm not leaving you to do just that? Oh, those are all good ones. But I trust Coda more, to be honest. Because he's here with us. We went over stuff. Now, it could have been a lie, but it does take him off the list a little bit more. <clears throat> um, okay, we'll say you know you're not off my list just yet. Someone had to sneak that box in here unnoticed. If you really spend as much time here as you say, that could have been you. No offense. Some taken, but I'll put that aside for now and let you get after the real killer. A shriek tells you the librarian has found the killer's bloody token and Coda shoves you towards the door. Go, and be safe. With a final gentle squeeze to your hand, Coda dashes back to the woman's side and you set out, giving the My Friend Finder app another glance. Coda said I should go to the person I trust least first. Okay, well, honestly, out of these three, the one I trust least is Zare. Because Zare keeps disappearing at the worst possible time. But I also don't completely trust Lucky because Lucky ran as well. Tyler stayed back the longest with Coda, but he left as well. So I'm going to go with Zare. Pivotal choice made, you chose to visit Zare first. As you sneak out of the library, you notice Zare's bubble is on the move and immediately latch onto their location. On the run, huh? Not for long, Zare. I'm on to you. You set out to follow Zare's dot, keeping a close eye on where they're headed, but every time you think you're getting close, they make another turn. This path is way too specific to be random. What are you up to, Zare? You manage to catch sight of them up the street. Oh, they don't look happy. But with every step, you find yourself getting further and further behind. There's got to be some way for me to keep up. You take a quick look around and spot a man riding by on a golf court, cart, a couple preparing to take a ride on a tandem bike, and a child's hoverboard left carelessly on the lawn. Uh, we don't want to do the tandem bike. Uh, we're going to do the hoverboard since it's nobody's on it. 
You reach in your wallet, chuck all the cash on cash on the grass in its place, and set off with the hoverboard. Because the guy could have fought us for the go gar, golf cart. So, oh, four to two plus. So that was the right choice. Sorry, kid, but maybe now you'll remember to put your toys away. In moments you've caught up, and you manage to catch a glimpse of someone ahead of Zare. Mr. Delphin. Wait a minute. That's Mr. Delphin. He's running against Mayor Jackson in this election. Gotcha. As Zare closes in, Mr. Delphin uh, closes in on Mr. Delphin and becomes clear that he's their target. Quietly, you follow them deeper in the neighborhood, cutting through backyards in between houses to keep up while remaining unseen. Subject arrives home promptly at 1.40 p.m. I'll need to be here waiting. That's sus. Were they keeping tabs on Mr. Delphin? You watch as Zare's eyes the house occupants before sneaking around to, back to the backyard and crouching behind a cherry blossom tree. You follow quietly, only for your foot to snap a twig. Huh? Zare, what the hell is going on? Get away from there right now or I'll scream. Uh, let's go with what's going on. Let's kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. Before you can say another word, Zare grabs your arm and yanks you down into a nearby bush with them. Shh, he's going to hear you. I'm starting to think that wouldn't be a bad thing. Well, if Zara's a murderer, I don't think they'd be pulling us down in the bush with him, so... I know this looks bad, but this has nothing to do with the murders. Yeah, sure it doesn't. No, Azrael, it's about the mayoral race. These murders have proven that my mom doesn't deserve to win the election. I'm trying to find a way to talk to him about it and get her disqualified. But if the mayor's kid is seen talking to her political rival... It would be a big scandal. You peer through the branches and see Mr. Delphin poke his head back out the door for a second, looking for the source of the noise. When he closes the door again, Zare loosens their grip just a little. I don't know if she knows who the killer is, but I found blueprints for the island in her office and, well, it's easier for me to show you. You hesitate, but let Zare lead you over to a huge oak tree growing out from a cluster of rocks. They push aside the tall grass at the base of the tree, reveal a narrow opening leading down into the dark. That's... sus. What the hell? Before you have a chance to protest, Zare slides into the hole feet first, disappearing into the darkness below. Come on, it's not far down. Not particularly reassured, you sit down on the grass and slide down into the tunnel. As your eyes adjust to the dark, you find yourself in some kind of dirt tunnel. What is this place? These are the tunnels that Stabby Joe used to escape. My mom's been keeping tabs on the killer's movements by tracking the bodies, and they all line up in these tunnels. I think my mom is waiting for the killer to use them to do her bidding before she takes them out. Seriously? I started mapping the tunnels myself week weeks ago to try and figure out what she was up to, and I'm pretty sure this is it. So you've known how to navigate these tunnels this whole time and just didn't say anything? I... Well, I couldn't be sure this was how the killer was getting around. But knowing about this could have helped us. How many tunnels could have been avoided or plugged or... Once you started talking to Bex, I knew I couldn't risk it getting back to her. Well, Bex, who has been onto your mom for a while now, by the way, has just been killed. I got her nose in a box at the library. But considering how well you know the tunnels now, I can't help but wonder if you knew that already. What? Azrael, I should have told you about the tunnels before. I know that now. But you know I'm not the killer, right? I thought I knew you, but now? I'm not so sure, Zare. You watch as hurt and disappointment spread across their face and a pit forms deep in your stomach. How could you say that? We're supposed to be friends, Azrael. We are friends. I just... I don't... I've got to go. Azrael! Your thoughts race as you pull yourself back out of the hole and onto the grass, only for your hand to find something. Zare's recorder with all their notes. Maybe this will tell me exactly what they've been up to, since I can't trust them to tell me anymore. Okay, I'm going to check on Lucky. 
pivotal choice made you decide to visit Lucky Second. Oh my god, I hope it doesn't... Tyler doesn't end up dead, but he's the only one I really trust out of all of them. As you scurry out of Mr. Kegler's backyard, you go answer your phone and Lucky's location on the map catches your eye. Immediately, your heart starts to pound. The hospital? That would explain that ancient pager of hers, but what if it's just a cover? Your finger hover over your finger hovers over Lucky's pulsing dot and you hope against hope that she's alright. I guess there's only one way to find out. For better or worse, I'm coming, Lucky. You rush into Morlick General Hospital, not stopping until you reach the front desk of the emergency room. Excuse me. I'm looking for a woman with dark hair and a blonde streak. Might have come in in a rush about this tall. You hold a hand over your head and immediately the nurse nods knowingly. That would be Miss Alvarez, but she and the woman she came here with are uh, with were already seen and sent to inpatient care. Let me pull up the room for you. As the nurse turns to her computer, her words settle over you. The woman she came with? She can't mean Bex, can she? I need to see her and figure out what's going on. You glance around the waiting area, hoping to catch a glimpse of Lucky, only to notice a familiar picture hanging on the wall. Dr. Uh, Kavya Santhar Kumar, head of the research and development. That's the Dr. Beck showed me info about. One of the killer's earlier victims. It's a pity we lost her. You turn to see the no nurse noting your gaze. I think I heard about her death. It was ruled an accident, right? Such a shame. More than you know, she just started a new study on pancreatic cancer. Cutting edge stuff. She was going to put this island on the map in a big way. Now she's just gone. The nurse clears her throat and hands you a slip of paper with a room number written on it. Thank you, and I'm sorry for your loss. You jet off to the impatient ward, turning down a near, nearly empty hallway. Just in time to see Lucky at the other end. There she is. A quick scan confirms to you that she's not here to be treated, and a sinking feeling fills your stomach. I can't believe it. The words fall from your mouth before you can stop them, and Lucky pauses before turning to look over her shoulder. If she finds out I'm here, I've lost the element of surprise. I should hide so she doesn't see me, run into another room, turn and calmly walk the other way. Uh, hide so she doesn't see me? Quickly, you look for any around for any something, anything to hide behind, but the hallway's empty. I guess I should have ran in another room. Gotta hide, gotta hide. For the love of all that's holy, where can I hide? At the last minute, you grab a patient's cart and hold it up, blocking chart, hold it up, blocking your face. I hope she didn't see that. But as you peer around the hard plastic, you catch sight of Lucky, looking quizzically in your direction. Whoops. Before slipping into the last room at the end of the hall. That must be Beck's room. You pick up the pace, hurrying down the hallway at a steady clip until all of a sudden, an alarm sounds. All at once, a contingent of hospital staff rush past, shoving you in their haste to get to the room Lucky entered. Oh my god. Without wasting a second, you follow, bursting into the room to find Lucky standing near the doorway as everyone crowds around the patient. Asriel, what are you doing here? Did, did you follow me? I did. And it's a good thing, too, because obviously, if you're a murderer, you're in over your head. I don't want to accuse her right off the bat, so we'll just say you're in over your head. You don't know that. You don't know anything. I know it's time for you to tell the truth. For you to explain why you're hurting people. I haven't hurt anyone. Will someone get them out of here? We need quiet while we work on the patient. No, please. You can't make me leave. The impassioned reaction catches you off guard, and only then do you look at the collection of flowers and holiday cards scattered around the room. She's not just a patient. She's my mom. Your gaze shoots to the bed, and sure enough, you find Lucky's mother laying in the bed at the center of the chaos. This is Alvarez? What? Why don't you two step on this side of the curtain? That way you'll be out of the way, but still in the room, hmm? The nurse relents as you step out of sight, and when you look for the second bed's occupant, you can scarcely believe your eyes. Mrs. Baumgartner, what are you doing here? I thought she was dead! 
Isn't that what we were told? I ran into a bit of trouble some time ago. Critical thinking. Your quick actions saved a life. So we did save her. We didn't lose her. Uh, but thanks to a bit of luck, I made it through, and I've seen, and I've been he here recovering ever since. I just have one final test before I leave. I'd be more than happy to help you get home. Oh no, dear. When I said leave, I meant the island. I'm retiring to the mainland, and I'm not coming back. This trouble you ran into, it wouldn't happen to have been hiding behind a stabby Joe mask, would it? At that, your teacher's sweet face darkens. No, when it came for me, there was no mask. Wait, does that mean you saw the killer? I did. Mrs. Baumgartner clutches at her cane, and you watch as her gnarled hands shake and late in fear. Next to you, Lucky draws a nervous breath. But I'm afraid the attack left me with defects. My memories of that night are fragile, to say the least. What do you remember? It was a face I knew, a face that gave me comfort, and I remember feeling safe, until I wasn't. Then I remembered feeling manipulated, horrified, and everything smelled of cherry blossoms. A quick rap sound sounds against the wall near the curtain, and when you look up, a doctor holding a clipboard stands nearby. We're all ready for you, Mrs. Baumgartner. Cherry blossoms. <sighs> Wasn't there cherry blossoms? in something that we had seen in this? I can't remember. You hurry to help the elderly woman into the wheelchair the doctor brought, and as she settles in, she catches your hand. Something evil lurks on this island, children. Hear me, and hear me well. Get out. Get out while you still can. As Mrs. Baumgartner heads out for her test, you and Lucky settles in on you and Lucky settle in at the foot of the bed. Her eyes locked on the curtain, separating her from her mother. Why are you here, Azrael? Did something happen? What's wrong? Lucky, it looks like I should be asking you that. Don't worry about that now. What's going on? I thought your mom was on the mainland with your aunt. I might have lied a little. Lucky deflates before your very eyes, everything in her fighting back tears. Mammy has cancer, and it's not looking good. I'm sorry, how can I help? There's got to be something I can do. I can handle things myself. All I need is for you to keep this quiet. Zaire told me you got those photos from a reporter, and I don't need her in my business. The sports channel loves a student-athlete sob story, and that is not going to happen to me and my mom. X won't be coming by anytime soon. She better not, or I'll wring her stupid neck. I think someone already beat you to it. That's why I'm here. The killer figured out I was talking to Bex and took care of her. A look of realization crosses Lucky's face, and immediately her expression goes stony. And you thought I had something to do with that? That's why you came. Not because you cared about me, but because you thought you'd catch me red-handed? I... you... I wouldn't have had to if you hadn't been keeping secrets. I keep telling you, I'm not a little kid. You can confide in me. It's not about you, Azrael. It's about her. Everything I do, I do for her. And lately, the weight of that has just gotten so heavy. Behind the curtain, the noise and chaos intensifies, and Lucky shakes so badly the bed quakes beneath you both. I know she wants to handle this on her own, but it seems like she needs someone to talk to. Support Lucky through this trying moment to improve your relationship and earn a boost to your fortitude score. Well, of course we're going to do that, so uh, Lucky talk to me or leave it be. Well, we're definitely doing the diamond choice. You grab Lucky's hand and give them a squeeze. Or hands and give them a squeeze. Lucina Valentina Alvarez, let me in. Something devastating is happening to you, and for some reason you feel like you have to shoulder it all alone, but you don't. You have me, so use me. Lay it all on me. I'll take it. For a moment she pauses, and as you meet her eyes, you see in real time as she decides to trust you completely. Mamie's got pancreatic cancer, and to say it's aggressive is putting it mildly. What? Why didn't you say something? 
Because if I did, you all would have been visiting her on your breaks and making a fuss, and she didn't need a fuss. She just needed to get better. But she just got worse. So much worse. That's when you started coming home. She tries to speak, but her voice breaks, and as you watch the pain streak across her face, you can't help but feel your own heartbreak. What about school, your family? Let's ask about her family. Alex is just a freshman, and Arcelia is still in eighth grade. Who's taking care of them? They stay with Abuela when I'm at school, and one of my tias goes by the house to check on it every week or so. They bring Alex and Silly with them to visit Mom sometimes, too, but she doesn't like them seeing her like that. I thought about entering the transfer portal to get closer to home and make everyone's lives easier, but when I mentioned it to Mamie, she just got... got mad. Because your school's basketball program is legendary, you can't give that up. It's your dream. I can and I would, if she would just stop being so stubborn. Well, I think I see where she gets it from. She's just like her mom. Your coach can't be happy with all that back and forth. Please tell me you mentioned, mentioned this to him. Of course. When all this started, we were about to go into playoffs. I couldn't just disappear. So I told my coach, and he spelled out exactly what kind of media circus I could expect if anyone found out. I've seen you in those post-game interviews. You handle those nosy questions like a champ. Because they're about me, my dating life, my injuries. No matter how invasive they get, I signed up for that. Mamie didn't. She didn't deserve to be the focal point of a sob story the sports channel runs ad uh, nauseum for ratings just because I'm her kid. But you don't deserve to have all this weighing on you at times with no one to talk to for fear of it getting out either. Lucky's shoulders sag, and for the first time in as long as you can remember, she doesn't look ready to take on the world. She just looks tired. Honestly, I know you're right. I can feel myself falling apart from trying to be everything for everyone at all times. Lucky, you're only human. What if you asked for help? Well, let's go with that one. What if you asked for help? From who, Azrael? My tias are already stretched thin with what they're doing now. That plus living their own lives is a lot to ask. My abuela is old enough to need full-time help of her own, so watching my brother and sister is the best she can do. I know you didn't want us making a fuss, but I'm sure if you told the others, they'd help. Mimi is too proud to have our motley crew running in and out of here, and frankly, so am I. We're past the point of pride, Lucky, and I know Mrs. Alvarez. She might not like it, but if it takes the burden from you, she'd put up with it. Look at yourself. You gesture the warrior lines forming on her forehead, her feet tapping nervously against the linoleum floors. Do you really think your mom would want you to be this worried, this scared, this alone? Do you think this is what she'd want for you? You see the moment when your words hit and a single tear rolls down her cheek. No. You have so many people who love you, and if you give them the chance, I know they'd come through for you. And now that I know, I'm here whenever you need me, day or night, in person or video call. I can do whatever. Paging Dr. Info, you got lucky to open up. Thank you, Azrael. As mad as I am about you stalking me, a part of me is glad I don't have to do this alone anymore. She heaves a ragged sigh and you sweep a, long, a lock of long, bottle blonde hair behind her ear before latching onto the back of her neck and meeting her eyes. I should kiss her or hug her. We're going to hug her. You've never been alone, Lucky. You wrap her in your arms, doing your best to imbue her with the strength she needs to soldier on, before pulling back to look at her. Whether I'm right beside you or a million miles away, I'm always right here. You tap the center of your chest and Lucky rolls her eyes before shooting you the first smile since you've been there. That was so effing corny, but still, thanks. I'm here for you if you need anything, okay? Seriously, anything at all. Thank you, but you don't have to worry. One of the only perks to being here for months on end is that the staff, the staff know me pretty well. I can even get them to snag me the good pudding cups from time to time. Wait a minute. Months? Yeah, she was diagnosed around Valentine's Day. I've been flying back and forth from school so she wouldn't be alone. So you were here, 
on the island, and nobody knew? I know what you're thinking, but... I... I don't know what to think right now. I've gotta go. Fine, but take this with you. Hospital bracelet, what's this for? I get one every time I come here. The barcode on it keeps a log, since I clearly need to prove my innocence. With the bracelet tucked in your fist, you head for the door, turning your head at the work being done on the, her mother just across the curtain. I hate to even think it, but with her coming back from school to see her mom so often, that leaves a lot of unaccounted for time. Okay, I'm going to check on Tyson. I think I keep calling him Tyler. Pivotal Choice made you waited to visit Tyson. So either this was a good thing or a bad thing. Okay, as you slip out of the hospital, you finally tap Tyson's contact and find that it puts him at the grocery store in town. Well, that seems like an okay place to be. Here's hoping Ty can help me make sense of everyone's stories. I mean, it sucks. She didn't tell anybody for months. I mean, I get she didn't want to tell him her mom was sick, but she could at least said she was back. When you get to the grocery store, you find Tyson's car in the parking lot, but you can't, can't glimpse him through the windows. No sign of him. A sharp noise from the grocery store alley draws your attention. A total innocuous sound, but still, you creep towards it. You peer around the corner, and sure enough... Damn it. Oh, no. He works here. Oh, my God. He's probably going to be mad that we're here. Tyson kicks the side of the bin angrily. His clothes are covered by a dingy apron that he angrily swipes his hands across like he's trying to get them clean. Which is of little help, considering the apron is covered in... Blood? He's probably a works in the butcher shop. No, don't even think it. Tyson wouldn't betray us like that. Tyson hangs his head, muttering something under his breath. You lean in as close as you dare to try to hear him. Hear him. I've got to tell them. This has gone way too far. Before you can confront him, he disappears through an unmarked door in the side of the building. If he is the killer, I shouldn't surprise him. I've got to find out for sure. I'll follow him through the side door by going through the front. Probably through the front, because if we try to go through the side door, it's going to be kind of obvious. Plus, it could lock. He might have had it propped open. We don't know. Okay, you speed walk through the grocery store, heading in the direction Tyson went, and immediately you spot him slipping behind the counter at the butcher section, his face guilty. As he tosses a look over his shoulder, you duck down, pretending to be interested in the bottom shelf deals. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Finally, Tyson pushes through an employee's only door, and you hurry after him. Peeking through the door's little window, your heart stops. Tyson's face is twisted in an expression you've never seen, sweat dotting his brow. Is he cook? I don't, I'm confused. But what strikes you is the massive knife in his hand and the flecks of blood that fly off of it with every frenzied swing of his arm. With every blow, a chunk of flesh flies off a mutilated carcass and your stomach heaves. Is that the rest of Bex? Why the hell would he do that in the grocery store? I mean, that seems a little too, uh, a little too much. Like, who, who would dismember a body? In a place where you could get caught. That doesn't make any sense. I think I'm going to be sick. I'm going to heave, hurl, hold. We're going to hold. We're not vomiting. You clench every muscle in your body and will yourself still. Somehow, it works. Fortitude plus? Not out of the wood yet, Azrael. As if on cue, Tyson straightens up, wiping the sweat from his brow. This doesn't make any sense. It can't. And yet you can't deny what your senses are telling you. Your heart hammers in your chest and you clench your fist as you come to a decision. If Tyson is the killer, he's not leaving this room. You know what? No. Mm. Is that like, you know what, no, I don't believe he's the killer? Because I don't think he's, I think he's just working in a butcher shop, okay? I think he works at the grocery butcher shop and he hasn't told anybody and he's embarrassed by the fact that he's doing that. While also doing like all his papers and stuff. This might be the biggest mistake of my life, but I can't survive this without trusting people. You still yourself, count to three, and then push through the doors. 
I know, I know, I'm almost done packing up the... It's me, Ty. He turns and his eyes fall on you. They widen in shock. Azrael, what, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same thing. You finally get a moment to look at the room you're in, take in Tyson's bloody apron and name tag. The cuts of meat spread on the butcher's block in front of him. Studying at home is a lot messier work than I would have imagined. I know I have some explaining to do, but in my defense... You mean, it's true? You hold up a hand and immediately silence fills the room. I don't think you could have actually done it. You, I, wait, 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 wait. Realization dawns on Tyson's face and he turns away, ripping off his gloves and tossing them in the trash. I lied about studying because I was coming here to work my shift. Wait, what? <laughs> I see everybody do that. You thought I was the killer? A wave of relief falls over you and you heave a huge sigh. Of course not. Something happened, so I came looking for you. All of you, but no one was where they said they'd be. Okay, we got up, up with Tyson. What happened? Are you alright? Immediately, Tyson's hands reach for you, checking you over to assure himself of your safety. I'm fine, but the reporter that sent me those pictures of Coda's room, well... The killer sent me a box at the library, and inside was a human nose. I'm so sorry, Azrael. I shouldn't have left you there. More importantly, you shouldn't have lied. Why didn't you feel like you could tell me? I mean, I would say that when I'd be more hurt. Not because he lied, but he felt like he couldn't. We have to be able to trust each other. Without trust, it's going to be ten times easier for the killer to pick us off. I know, I know. I just... I just couldn't take telling you the truth and having everyone look at me like I'm a loser. No one's going to hear about this and think any less of you, Ty. That's because you don't know the whole story. He pauses before looking around at the humble kitchen forlornly. If he's this down about it, maybe getting it off his chest would be for the best. Hear Tyson out to strengthen your relationship and gain a boost to your fortitude score. Of course we are. I want to see that frown turned upside down, so <laughs> we're going to learn Tyson's secret, then tell it to me. It can't be that bad. What happened? I... Tyson takes a cursory look around and then flushes. Nervously, he wipes his hand on his apron and heads for the door, abandoning his bloody work. Here, why don't you follow me? We can talk in the break room. There you get settled into the, into the couch, your eyes locked on Tyson. Okay, Spill. The truth is, I got expelled from school my sophomore year. You? Expelled? Ty, what happened? Long story short, I missed you guys. Turns out, getting adopted into a friend group by an extrovert in high school doesn't give you practice with making friends on your own. So, I decided to rush a fraternity. As Tyson nudges his glasses up the bridge of his nose, you wait for the punchline, only to realize he's completely serious. Wait, really? I didn't think you were the frat boy type. I'm impressed. I mean, he definitely doesn't seem the, the frat boy type, uh, but I have to say, I'm, I'm impressed. Tyson's gaze snaps to you, his eyes wide. Why? I'm sure you can tell from the context clues this isn't a happy story. I mean, but he put himself out there and he tried. I'm still proud of you for trying. Stepping out of your comfort zone like that is what college is for, and anyone who tells you differently is just afraid to be who they really are. Well, I definitely gave it my all. Hours at the gym, personal tutoring for some of the brothers that needed the most help. I treated them like I would any of you guys, because we were supposed to be family. Brothers. But they never seemed to feel that way about me. Oh, Ty. You motion for him to join you on the couch, but he waves you off, his feet pacing across the tiled floor. I never felt like I fit in there, but I didn't want to just quit and, and disaffiliate, so I just tried harder. It's a tale as old as time. Frat boy jerks see someone who just wants to belong, and they dangle the carrot while wielding the stick. Tyson's cheeks flame. Am I really that much of a cliché? 
Shame coaches every word, causing anger to roar in your chest. No, there's nothing wrong with wanting a human connection, and it's not your fault they picked on you. Maybe not, but it is my fault for being willing to do anything to relate to them. He ducks your gaze, and as his eyes settle on his feet, your stomach sinks. Ty, what did you do? The chapter president asked me to asked me to be the vice president of the intellectual development. I thought the role meant helping brothers study. Turns out the job description was more along the lines of taking tests for them. Unsurprisingly, we got caught, and they all banded together and threw me under the bus. Next thing I knew, I was working here full time. But that was over two years ago. Why didn't you say anything? Haven't you looked for something else? I mean, why didn't he say anything? You just slumped off with your tail between your legs? Do you have any idea how embarrassing it is for Mr. Most Likely to Succeed to not even graduate college? I just couldn't face everyone. Not to mention I let everyone down. My mom was so disappointed. It's obvious his, his, he's reliving the moment and before you can think about it, you're off the couch and standing in front of him. Sometimes things get away from us. It's not fun, but you learn and you do better going forward. The people who love you understand that, and if you bother to open up to them, I'm sure they'd tell you so themselves. Azrael, I know you're trying to be helpful, but even just admitting this to you is excruciating. I can't tell anyone else. Oh, come on, Ty. I'm not judging you. But you should. You all should. You fought for a great study abroad of opportunity, and you have a published paper as a college junior. Lucky's clearly going to, to the league and then med school. Zare's going to be a fancy DC lawyer. Code is going to be the next Spielberg. Context clues, you got the full story from Tyson. You're all outgrowing me, and I know it was wrong, but that's why I lied. I wanted to stave off you off being your pathetic friend just a little longer. You tip Tyson's chin up, bringing his gaze to yours. Outgrowing you would be like outgrowing a limb tie. We're all connected, and if one of us does well, we all do. Our group isn't about who can stand the tallest on their pedestal. It's just about love, and no one's going to love you less because of one mistake. Least of all me. Tyson's shoulders sink from their bunched position and around his ears, and relief begins to wash over him. I hope so, because I've lost so much already. I can't lose you too. Tyson, you could never lose me. I'm your friend in good times and bad. Oh, you could never lose me. After all, what would I do without your big strapping shoulders? You brush imaginary dust from them, and Tyson straightens, making them more broad under your touch. It's not like they're a trait specific to me, so something tells me you'd survive. You were supposed to say something romantic like, the better for you to lean on. Ah, got it. Let's try again. You work your fingers across the expanse of his shoulders and up the back of his neck until they tangle in the roots of his hair. As you catch him peering at you, your lip, at, at your lips, you smile. Whatever would I do without your soft lips? The better to kiss you with? His voice is whispered quiet, even as his eyes shine with anticipation and you laugh. Prove it. Tyson slide his, slides his hand around your waist, pulling you closer as he tilts his head and presses a kiss to your lips. When you finally separate, Tyson is grinning. You have no idea how much that means to me. Of course. But we do need to talk about the elephant in the room. You pull back, and as Tyson nods solemnly, you can see he already knows where you're headed with this. You mean the fact that I lied? It's not just that you lied, Ty. The murder started in March. I'd rule you out because you'd have been at school, but if you've been here this whole time... I can prove I'm not the killer. Tyson rushes over to the bulletin board hanging on the wall and hastily rips off a piece of paper. It's a copy of my work schedule. Every time I said I had to leave to do homework or study, I was here. I promise. Tyson's schedule. Thanks. He shoves the paper in your hands, and as you glance down at the various names, your hands start to shake. I... I gotta go. Azrael, wait. But before you can hear anything else, you're rushing towards the exit, desperate to get away. Man, she's been lied to by everybody. I don't even know who to trust at this point. As the sun sets, you head for home, your thoughts in a whirl. I can't believe it. They all lied to me. 
all but one. As you head inside, you pull out your phone to check the messages from Coda. Uh, all clear with the cops. Nose is going to the morgue while they look for the rest of her. Please let me know when you're safe. Not being able to hold you all day is killing me right now. Being held would definitely make things better because you're not going to believe what happened. Every single one of them lied, Co. I'm so heartbroken. I don't know who to believe. As you finish your text, you pause before making a left into Destiny's room instead of a right into yours. Everything looks exactly the same, and if you stand still enough, you can almost imagine she's only just stepped out a minute ago. Believe it or not, I wish you were here, Des. If you were, you know exactly what to do. It would be so much easier to handle all of this together. To finally be the siblings we were supposed to be all along, I feel like I got robbed. But one thing is for sure, I'm going to figure this out, Des, I promise. Your phone buzzes in your pocket, pulling you out of your thoughts, and you reach for it, expecting to see Coda's name on the screen. New inbox from Bex. Oh god, new image message. Instead, Bex's name pops up with a small thumbnail of an attached photo. Quickly you tap to open it, your heart pounding. Oh god, I don't want to know. <gasps> no! Oh my god, not Tyson! Only to find Tyson gagged and tied to a chair, his eyes wide with terror staring back at you. The phone buzzes again, this time with just two words. Your move. Oh my god. Oh my god, no! Is that because we picked him last? Oh my god, maybe we sh- But it said to pick who you trusted the most last. So it could have still been Becky or um, Zare. Wow. I mean that that was a good that was a good chapter because I I have no idea. I have no idea at this point. I I don't know who it is. It could even be Coda. Coda could be involved. And it was going to happen regardless. Oh my goodness, guys. I hope you really enjoyed that because I know I did. So chapter 8 is reliving the gory days. You find yourself back at the place where it all began. But will someone in your group meet their untimely end? Oh god, please don't kill Tyson. Please, he's my favorite. Don't kill him. Even though I keep calling him Tyler, please don't kill him. <laughs> But I hope you guys enjoyed that. Let me know down in the comments uh, down below what you're feeling about uh, the game so far. Because it's I, the story is amazing. Um, it's really good. It's, you know, Pixelberry at their peak with their stories. And I absolutely love it. it. Just enjoying it. Like, who do you think is the killer? Who would you have picked? Like, would you have trusted Zare more or Lucky more? Uh and, you know, went to Tyson first, because I'm really curious if I would have picked in a different order, if whoever I went to last, whether it had been Lucky or Zare, if they would have been the ones in the chair. So, I, I mean, it's definitely interesting uh, to, to like, go back and redo and just to see. But I think I'll just leave it there um, and maybe go back when the, the whole game's out and done with. But I hope you guys enjoyed. Please leave me a like, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you next time. Bye.